I am an immigrant. I grew up in Argentina. I moved to Europe when I was 27 to be with a woman I loved. After a few months, my visa expired and I was undocumented. The stress was unbearable. I, I remember my nerves when I had to travel from Brussels to London while I was looking for a job. And it came as a shock because I, I, I remember my grandparents' stories, all of them European migrants who arrived in Argentina beginning of the 20th century, when the American continent received 55 million Europeans. As far as I knew, all of them took their own decisions, forced by their circumstances, and also having to face a huge challenge in their destination countries, but without having to ask a special permit or authorization to do so. So what had happened? I, I was just trying to be the captain of my soul and take my own decisions and, and decide where to live, where to work and love. But that wasn't possible. Yes, I am a migrant. And based on my experience and back up by economical data, studies from sociologists, and a terrible humanitarian crisis, I can say that the current migrant system is broken. I am a migrant, but uh, you can feel safe. You don't have to worry. I'm not a rapist. I'm not a drug dealer. And believe me, I'm not here to steal your wallet. As funny or, or shocking this comment may, may sound, sadly enough, we keep on hearing this type of comment from politicians in different parts of the world. Institutional racism feeding social racism. Actually, my grandparents' generation have to face similar type of prejudices. It's a sort of karma that follows migrants over time, always necessary and always rejected. Actually, for me, it took me a few more years to fully understand how hard was being a migrant in Europe. It was September 1998, and something really horrible happened. I fully understood that at, in that moment that migration and human rights were not on the same side. Semira Adamu, a 20 years old Nigerian asylum seeker, died after some officers put a pillow on her face while she was being deported from the Brussels airport. The deportation attempt was recorded on video. Apparently, that was a normal procedure followed by the Belgian police when they have to face a difficult deportation. And then later on, broadcasted on national television. Viewers were shocked, me being one of them, witnessing the gendarmes laughing and cracking jokes while suffocating Semira. Semira suffered a heart attack. The gendarmes were following a pillow restraint method, which, to my surprise, it was legal. How was that possible? Suddenly, that idealistic idea of Europe being the home of the human right was broken, was also broken. This is a topic when we start analyzing migration full of misunderstandings, misconceptions, and with an extremely high level of manipulation. When that happened to Semira, not only that it broke my idea of Europe as the home of the human right, but also it was all against what I have studied so far. Migration is the oldest action against poverty, I learned from the economist John Galbraith, when he was also explaining that migration was positive at an individual level, so for the migrants themselves, but also at the general level when we look at the country of origin and the country of destination and the benefit that the migration generates. Actually, 
all the economical studies carried out by financial institutions, being in Spain, UK, France, or the US, show that migrants give more to the welfare state than what they take out of it. A recent report from the IMF and the World Bank explains that migration is key for the global economic development. I even remember a report from La Caixa from 2011 explaining how migration was a key factor for boosting the Spanish economy in the last decade, and also very important for the development of the social support system in, in, in Spain. But what was very interesting for that report was the surprise expressed by the analyst because that type of information doesn't get to the media. Therefore, there is a, a, a general opinion on, or the majority of the citizenship are under the assumption that migration is a problem. And even more, that migration generates costs that put in danger their own well-being, while it is exactly the opposite. If we wouldn't have migrants, we would have to invent them. But when we say that this is a, a theme and a topic extremely manipulated, we have to remember what Bauman explained when he said that the administration, as they don't have the power, the interest, and the willingness to really face the problem we have as a global society, that means climate change, inequality, then they use key topics to gain public support. And guess which are those? Migrants, migration, and security. And combining both, give us, a re as a result, a perfect manipulation tool. Blaming migrants have become the ideal tool for legitimacy of different governments in different parts of the world, and also becoming a sort of global habit. And um, for that global habit to be there, then have to be followed with measures, and those measures have terrible humanitarian consequences. Just this year, more than 700 people have died in the Mediterranean Sea without even getting to the news. So we are getting used to it. We are becoming insensitive to the suffering of others. We are becoming insensitive to the suffering of those that are invisible and have no voice. Can we imagine just for a minute what would be the overall feeling, even within this room, if those 700 women, men, and children would have been Europeans. Last year, 14 people died every single day trying to reach Europe in the Mediterranean Sea, more than 5,000 people during the whole year. Since the killing of Semira, more than 45,000 people have died in the Mediterranean Sea, knowing that the Sahara Desert is as deadly as the Mediterranean Sea were confronted with a terrible tragedy. And what makes things even worse, were confronted with an avoidable tragedy. This tragedy is a consequence, not of a series of ac accidents, it's a consequence of the decisions and the policies we are applying here in Europe. Sometimes when they ask me, why did, why, did you, why did you get involved in a project like Mezcladis? Why, why did you decide to change your life from being a business consultant to a social entrepreneur? And my initial answer is that I, I really have a strong desire that future generations will be ashamed and will regret, regret this period in our shared history. It was the year 2004 when I moved to a new city from rainy Brussels to sunny Barcelona. And as I mentioned, I decided to change up from a business consultant to a social entrepreneur. And actually, what, what I was doing was to align my feeling, emotions, and my belief with my daily job. I was already in the process of doing that while I was in Belgium by volunteering with a social project working with my grandchildren. But I wanted that to be the center of my attention. Mezcladis was designed as a non-profit organization to build bridges between 
the nationals and the migrant communities, and to empower people to fight for their rights and normalize their life. It's a project designed at the neighborhood level with the intention to, to realize the key promises, the two key promises we have behind a diverse society, to benefit from the enormous energy of surpassing which resides in every migrant project, and then to enrich each other from our cultural differences. How we organized Mescladis in order to have a positive impact in the social transformation this country is going on. Because when I arrived here, Spain and Catalonia were going through a massive social change. Because these areas, in a very short period of time, moved from a place where the people have to emigrate and look for a better future somewhere else, going to Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, or Latin American countries, to areas receiving migrants from different parts of the world. So what we tried to do was to have a positive impact, again at the local level, neighbor neighborhood level, trying to leverage the challenges, opportunities, and also facing the problems that were part of this social change. And we organized Mezcladis in, in three key areas. The basics of the basis of Mezcladis is a program we call Cooking Opportunities. There we train people in the hospitality sector, kitchen helpers and waiters. We open a door with agreements we have with hotels and restaurants for our students to go there, do an internship, get a job, and normalize their situation because we work mainly with people that are not at risk of exclusion. They are in exclusion already. Because when you are undocumented, you are not without papers. This is something that doesn't ex really explain your situation. We, we rather say without rights. So you don't have the right to work. You don't have the right to health care. And you are even at risk of ending up in a detention camp. Paradoxically, here in Barcelona, our beautiful city, we have, in the same location where we have the free trade zone, we have a detention camp for non-Europeans. Where you have all the goods coming from different parts of the world, we have that prison for non-European people that have not committed a crime, just being born in the wrong place, apparently. Those, the, the Spanish acronym for these places are CIE, Centro de Internamiento de Extranjeros, Center for Detention of Foreigners. Imagine also for a moment what would be the case if, for instance, I don't know, in Venezuela, they would have a CIE, Centro de Internamiento Europeo, Center for Detention of Europeans. We will have all the European politics, the European Union, claiming and saying that Venezuela is violating the human rights of our European citizens, and they would be right on saying that. We are doing that every single day. We have seven of those detention centers in Spain, and we have more than 140 distributed in Europe. The second part, if, if Quinan Opportunitat, Cooking Opportunities, is the basic of our, problem, uh, our program, then we have a work, an important part of our work, also in what we define as community development. And what we do there is, first of all, to use cooking as a tool. Because cooking is a powerful tool to work diversity, because it gives us the possibility to exchange our different visions and experiences using something that we define us as human beings. We are the only animals on planet Earth that modify the elements to feed ourselves. And we do it in a social manner. We, if we close our eyes and we want to travel to a place full of emotions, feelings, we are probably going to end up in a kitchen with our brothers, sisters, grandparents, and parents laughing, discussing, uh, arguing, uh, and talking about our feelings and emotions. And that's what we do with different workshops and initiatives we do for children, the elders in our neighborhood, and adults as well. And then we also have a program we call Migrant Dialogues with the intention to give to the people, to the migrants, a voice and a face. 
A few weeks ago, I was in a school, and I was training the delegates of the courses to then be the guided in an exhibition we have in that school, in an, a photographic exhibition. And I asked to the student, do you watch television? All of them say yes. And then the second question was, have you seen someone from Syria, now that we have a refugee crisis with Syria, have you seen someone from Syria talking about his feelings, his emotions, uh, seeing his sense of humor and, and uh, the, the, the terrible pain that person went through? And all of them answered no. We don't see them. We always have other people talking about the migrants. So it's very important to put a face and to give a voice, because when we don't do that, it's the first step to take the, huma the humanity out. And when we take the humanity out, we can then kill them. And that's exactly what we are doing. Then, if we have the hardware of Mezcladiz with that cooking opportunities program, it's something very clear. We can measure how many people start, how many people finish, and how many people do get a job. We train 80 people every year, and we have an employment rate of 35%. Then the community development develop program is our software. It's much more difficult to measure. Albert Einstein used to say that it's easier to modify an atom than a prejudice. And probably he was right, but we have to try. And we have to try because what we have to do is to break the hate. Uh, when you hate, there is no place for a doubt. And what we try to do is to break that by promoting the doubt and new questions. Last but not least, sustainability is very important for a project like Mezcladiz. And we look at sustainability from a holistic perspective. We look at our own sustainability. We generate, if we look at last year's budget, 95% of that budget with our own economical activity. But then we also take care of the sustainability from an environmental perspective. Because it's very important if today we have 265 million migrant, international migrants, we expect 200 million more in the decades to come because of climate change. So how do you do it if you are Mezcladiz? Well, we have two restaurants and we look at our suppliers, and our suppliers are La Facheda uh, for the yogurts and the ice cream, a beautiful social project, and the wines are from Olivera, another beautiful social and very interesting social project here in, 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 in Catalonia. And then the juices are from Calvars, uh, producing juices via agroecological processes, the same from our veg veg vegetables from La Costurica. So that's the way we have a say in that sense. And then, and very, very important, we have the emotional sustainability. Because when you lose your roots, when you are in a new place, you need to have a place that is a reference for you. And we do that for our team and for the 80 students we have every single year. I'm personally a, a very optimistic person. I wake up every day with a lot of energy. But f intellectually, I wouldn't say that. I'm not that sure about the sapiens part of our species. But I like to behave like the hummingbird. Uh, there is a story that was created by the Guarani people that live in the north of Argentina, Paraguay, and the south of Brazil, that uh, tells a story of a big fire in the woods where all the, where all the animals are running away. And the hummingbird, el colibri, flies to the river, takes water, and back to the fire, going back and forward. In one of those trips, the lion stopped the hummingbird and asked, what are you doing with your little pig? And the hummingbird answered, I'm doing my part. I believe that all of us, we have to do our part. Regardless where we are, what type of job we have. If we have we have a lot of work to do to have a better place to live for all of us. Are you ready to do your part? Thank you very much.